real life superpowers. Usually, if you hire the right people, these would be people who could easily make four hundred thousand dollars, five hundred thousand dollars a year with with uh, Microsoft, Facebook, Google. You know, you need to sell them the dream as well, uh, and they need to believe in in the potential. Otherwise, you're you're not going to get the top talent. Welcome to the Real Life Superpowers podcast. No, I should hear together with Vanen Manipaz. Today, we're excited to introduce Roy Gottlieb, who is currently the co-founder and CEO of a backstell cybersecurity startup. Before embarking on this latest venture, he spent almost a decade on the investor front, co-founding and serving as a general partner at Cardamon Capital, serving as an investment manager at Samsung Ventures, and collaborating with industry titans such as Lightspeed, Teammate, Insight Partners, and more. He was also the co-managing director of the Israeli Young Venture Capital Forum for six years, helping shape the next generation of venture capital leaders. Without further ado, let's dive in. Real Life Superpowers Superpowers. Hey, welcome to Real Life Superpowers. Hey, Ray. Hey, guys. Nice to meet you and a uh, pleasure being here. So, uh, stealth startup. How does that feel? You're, you have a background that is completely on the other end of the table, um, and, and we're definitely going to touch your investment career, but how is it, what's it like these days to be on the other end? It still, still feels like an imposer, which was a major reason that I'm kind of switch sides um you know it, it feels predominantly heads down doing whatever is the most pressing matter of the company at the point in time uh learning a lot which is a lot of fun um many challenges i've never done this before so uh we're we're still at the very steep place at the learning curve and uh other than that i don't know that's like lead the discussion i can probably elaborate on, on many different aspects what, so what do you mean by saying that uh the reason that you stepped that you stepped to the other side was because you felt an imposter because you have a very accomplished career as an investor do you mean that you felt as an investor that you're an imposer so being on the other side I've, I've, i've spent eight and a half years of my life uh working on the vc side of the of the table and you know i i definitely represent myself and myself alone uh, in, in this perspective, but you predominantly feel like you're following patterns, you're working with very high volumes, you, you manage the risk as a portfolio. Uh, you don't really get to, to dive really deep with any of your portfolio companies, even if you're extremely thesis driven and you're trying to do your best uh, working hands on with the founders. And then also Mostly because of my personal background um, or or actually lack of operational background within startup companies, I felt like you're spending a lot of actually all of your time or definitely a significant amount of your time either evaluating companies or helping build companies uh, or giving advice that are supposed to be hands on, but they're very high level pattern based and they're not real life experience based, which means you mostly lack. context that is very important for the decision um, and and that made me feel like I need to see what is it from the inside of building a company bearing the weight uh, having the context uh, managing the risk as a zero to one and not you know not part of a hedge risk being in a portfolio uh, etc so Obviously, it's just one reason that I moved, but a major one. I have a question about that. Like most entrepreneurs, it's like their, their end game goal, dream to become an investor, right? Um, and on the other side, and which is totally agreeable, being an enabler is not the same thing as being the, the content itself, meaning like you're like enabling companies to do their dream, right? So like what would be like the, the pros and cons of being an investor as opposed to being an entrepreneur? Oh, there are, by the way, there are endless pros in being an investor. Uh, you wake up every morning, you work hard, but you probably meet the smartest people the industry has to, to, to offer. Uh, you're meeting very ambitious people, 
literally changing the world or at least or, or at the very least believing uh, in what they do so it has the potential of changing the world uh, they're very capable 99% of the times I would claim more capable than yourself um, so it's it's a privileged person position you, you know you, you you wake up every morning you're hearing about great ideas amazing teams amazing people amazing backgrounds um, and and you get to to learn and and experience their war, world uh, being part of that process um, so honestly I, I I think that probably for you You know if you're not an entrepreneur if you're a past entrepreneur it's it's I, I I now understand why it's like the classic move for some entrepreneurs you know so you you build one two three five companies and then uh, you you take that experience to the VC uh, side of the table um, but like I've mentioned before it also has some downsides you you never have the full context um, you know uh, I felt like for example, It's very easy to set quotas, right? You guys need to make it to $1 million AR in, in the next two quarters. You need to do 3x EO of a year in order to be successfully raising your next round. But have you ever built a sales machine? Have you ever hired you know, um, any of these functions that you claim that we need to, to recruit in order to uh, achieve these milestones, etc.? I, I, I never had. So uh, I, I felt like to me that's a very important step. And, and now as an entrepreneur, what's the biggest difference on the high high note, like on the good stuff? What do you feel that's that's giving you more? So I, f- I feel like as a VC you learn the breadth of, of the of, of the spectrum. You don't get to dive uh, as deep. Um, and, and I think that uh, at least I, in, I highly enjoy, You know clearing my mind and diving as deep as I can into uh, one topic becoming a you know an industry expert and and, and learning as much as I can um, I believe you're somewhat closer to the value generation um, as, as we've we've mentioned before uh, VCS are enablers they're providers of capital and, and business advice and guidance and, and and many great things but they're one step away in the value chain uh, from at least from a customer perspective um, and it's it's pretty fulfilling to actually be in touch with the market understand the pains uh, and at least you know where, where we stand uh, highly believe in and just the getting the first steps of, of solving the pains and, and, and hearing and seeing that excitement from uh, from customers and and also if you're building for scale and, and, and high value companies just scale much much more right like uh, very few VCS could be 20,000 people companies right or firms uh, where every successful company has the potential to Of becoming a, 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 a huge business is this like a, like a personal experiment for you in a sense not in the sense that you you don't care enough or that you're not taking the startup seriously but do you feel like this is going to be what sort of closes a circle here a cycle here for you and enables you once you have that validation for yourself to go back to the other end of the table and become a Uh, it, a better I want to say super investor but in many senses you sort of already were on that in, under that status but let's let's put labels aside and just figure out is this your uh, way back to investing with more in a more informed and experienced way no um, I don't know what's the end of the cycle um, If, if you ask me today probably the next thing would be to start another company oh, yeah? not to, to go um, again to for, at least for me now the learning curve is is steeper I've spent eight and a half years on the VC side and and just a few months uh, building a company and uh, so, so for me uh, for now it, 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 that would be the the go-to but I For, on, like honestly and I know this like many founders are always selling and marketing I don't know what's next I, I literally don't know and, and we've burned the bridge and we 
we're now fighting the battle of we're making this work. Whatever comes next is irrelevant for the discussion. It's literally irrelevant. We need to make this work. And how much do you feel that the almost decade of investment experience and being able to be with the sort of bird's eye view, seeing so many different companies, where they failed, what worked, I'm even putting aside your actual advice and your position within the the ecosystem, but just just the ability to have that vision and insight from into so many startups is that something that you're seeing as an enabler in in what you're doing right now are you are you do you have like examples of things that your pitfalls you're able to to now avoid based on what you've experienced before I'm sure there there is like we we bring everything we have and all of our accumulated experiences to to what we do right like uh i'm 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 not saying it's the best um you know package that you can bring to to that experience but definitely um there are many many learnings probably you know one of the strongest superpowers of being a vc is being capable of you know uh investigating a new area uh asking the right people getting to know the right people who who should you ask or whose opinion should you get on a specific topic and when you're uh, a first-time founder doing many things for the first time. Uh, you're running product for the first time. You're building marketing for the first time. You're running sales for the first time. You're speaking to customers for, for the first time. I, 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 that's an endless effort, right? Um, so the having the muscle of, okay, now I need to do this. Let's learn about this market. Let's get to you know a few industry leaders, pick their brain, see what they say. How should we avoid uh, the pitfalls that you're mentioning? So that muscle comes in very, very handy. Uh, for example, we can, wi- within a matter of, of a few hours or, or, or days max, uh, pick the brains of industry leaders within every sector, potentially even many times pulling them in, in their process um, and trying to avoid as many mistakes as we can. Doesn't mean we're not going to make our own. Were, were you scared to make that decision? Like, was it exciting? Was it scary? Like... The leap of faith, you know what I mean? Because you're like, you're already amazing at what you did before, you know what I mean? So you have what to lose in ego senses, right? Was it, was it a scary moment? Yes, <laughs> very much so. But I believe we grow and learn with when we get out of our comfort zone. And and by the way, you you, you can fail so many people, right? Like you, 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 you've been part of the VC industry, so they all know you. You're not just a random founder. So you literally raise money from people that you know and, and, and love and, and many times are already friends with. And then some of your investors, by the way, are close friends or, or, or people who believed in you in your previous career. Now you can either fail them or not. Um, personally, you know, on, on, on my personal status, I have my wife, my, my son that I want to be a good example for. Is it scary? Yeah. Uh, but I think, uh, like I mentioned before, every entrepreneur that I know suffers from a uh, at least some form of an imposter syndrome. And part of it is just being scared of failing everyone uh, because you, you f- feel like you should have all the answers, but if you have all the answers, you probably also have none of them. So, so it's, it's, it's just the ongoing battle that you're, you're, you're living every day. So what's most challenging for you? At this stage, and I don't mean like from a specific product perspective, I mean in general, in order to be able to lead towards where you want to lead to, what do you feel you have to work on in yourself most? It literally changes every day, but I think that if I kind of try and characterize our, our biggest challenges are so you wake up every morning, you're trying to identify what are the existing bottlenecks within the company or within your general direction that you're, you're going towards that if you actually put your own resources into and your full weight would significantly accelerate, right? You, you, the, the founder's time is probably the most precious resource every company has. Um, irrespective of, by the way, that time is the most precious resource we all have as human beings. Um, but definitely if, if you're looking at it from a company perspective, then, uh, you know, the executive team and, and, and the founders are uh, the most precious resource and, and, and scars. So identifying what are the bottlenecks every day, and, and believe it or not, they change quite rapidly. 
Uh, so learning, identifying, b- catering for what, how can you add value in that area? That's, that's one. Um, and then obviously there are personal challenges because you need to manage the relationship with your investors, your relationship with your partner, the relationship with your family. Uh, everything's got a, everything gives, right? There, there are no free, free meals, uh, unfortunately. Um, so you're continuously f- feeling slash scaled of failing everyone, which you probably to some extent are. Um, to me, these days, these are the, the, the two biggest ones. Um, I don't feel like I'm, I'm a good parent. I don't feel like I'm a good husband. I don't feel like I'm a good manager. I don't feel like I'm a good co-founder. I don't feel like I'm a good investee. But I'm, I'm doing the best we can. So, uh, so how, how are you, what are you doing to actively feel different? What steps are you taking? Do you have a mentor? Is there some playbook in your head how to improve on all those fronts what what are you doing to change that just putting on the most burning fire i don't know we i i, I wish i could found, find the mental uh i i probably can but i again you need to to decide that this is something that you want to do and then map who the potential mentors are and who would be the right fit for you and get to know them and make sure that they have time for you and then you have a good relationship and it's probably one of the things I should do, but it's, it's just not the most pressing matter at this time. Right. Right. Tell me something, you know, like, like, is, is that kind of like a motivation for you? Not like being like, cause, cause you're a great guy and you're successful. I'm sure you're also a great dad. So the feedback that you're giving yourself, do you feel like it's like a motivator, you know, like sort of like Michael Jordan always, you know, went, went and built a nemesis, even though the other guy didn't even, even know he was, who's in the game, you know? So like, do you think it's like a part of like empowering yourself? Is that like a motivator? First of all, I think, you know, put, put us on a timeline. You would see that w- w- when Michael Jordan was my age, he was a lot more successful than I am like on an absolute scale. Um, and, and, and then again, thank you for the warm words, but no, I don't feel like I'm, but, and by the way, I know I'm not a, a good enough of a parent because on, on average, on an average week, I see my son once a day. Uh, sorry, once a week. So there is one one day a week that I pick him up from kindergarten and I get to I don't know go to the cons- conservatory with him because, because like to do to do an activity. But it's like one day a week. I, I wouldn't say that I'm the perfect dad. I'm probably far from that. And the, the sad thing is that because everything gives, some things are somewhat taken for granted, right? It, it, or, or, or at least get less attention. Um, but I don't think that uh, you're, I'm at least not getting energy out of it. It's just the cost of doing business or, or, or the price you pay for being an entrepreneur. But you believe it's important enough, right? You're doing something like important, you're doing something also for, for let's say the sun itself, but you're doing something important also for yourself. Like, ah, absolutely. I, I believe, I, I believe we're setting the foundations for our, our, our business and our, our individuals and our families to be at their peak. But uh, I, I think I'm doing the, uh, or I want to believe I'm doing the right uh, thing at every point in time. But, uh, you know, the, the, the fact that you know where you're going and you believe in the goal doesn't mean that the way is easy. And those feelings, if we, if we go back to the beginning of your investment career, are they familiar? Have you been there before? Less. Less. A little bit less. A little bit less. I always believed in working hard. Uh, but again, uh, VC is a much more... After we raised the fund, okay? So when we started raising the fund, obviously it was like zero two, And again, we went back to garage mode. Didn't have any salaries for a couple of years. You know, literally building the, 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 the fund and taking a lot of risk. But... Uh, the day-to-day felt a lot, a lot less risky. It's less zero or one. It's a lot more linear. Yeah, and, and yet you're saying that you're probably going to do another venture after this one. So I'm just a few months in, into this one. So again, I, I don't know what's next. That's, that's the TLDR. Right? I do not know what's next. I'm honing in on you not saying, what did I do to myself? I'm going back as soon as I'm able to prove that I didn't fail here. 
and 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 yet despite all the challenges that you're describing very very openly and vulnerably you're not you're assuming that this isn't the last time you're taking a stab at this so i'm just trying to understand what the appeal is in light of all the struggle learn growth and generating value those are great motivators We're excited to be collaborating with the Israeli website CTEC, owned by Kalkalist, Israel's leading business newspaper. CTEC is the gateway of the Israeli high-tech to the tech world and vice versa. If you're not already a regular reader, we strongly recommend that you check out kalkalistech.com, C-A-L-C-A-L-I-S-T-E-C-H.com, to stay up to date on all high-impact stories from the Israeli tech scene. And Ray, Ray how did you, you become an investor? Like, how did that start? So that's a funny story. It's, it probably goes back to my childhood. So I, I grew up as a computer kid, but by the way, I, I thought, by the way, then that I was great. Uh, back then, you know, it, uh, I started coding when I was young and, and uh, there was the IRC, like the chat infrastructure that a lot, what, what now is a dark web probably migrated to. But back then you could trade credit cards and, and, and exploits and, and, scam pages and whatever you, you want to do on the on the IRC etc I'm, I'm talking at the age of like 12 13 14 15 etc um, then at some point I I migrate I found myself at unit 81 uh, the technology unit of the intelligence corps in give a time and pretty quickly I've learned that I suck um, like there are much more brilliant people in that field than than what I've ever imagined in my life. Um, which, and, and by the way, I didn't have any broader perspective, right? Like I was this kid that grew up in Rishon and I went to the Gymnasia Realit and I went into the computer, like Techem, uh, Ana Machshevim, like the, 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 the computer class. Um, so as, as part of that, we were, you know, the bleeding edge, but we, we didn't have any, any, any perspective on the world. And then, That gave me a very strong feeling of I need to find something that, that combines technology, but I'm definitely not going to be the, the strongest researcher or the strongest developer or like I'm li- literally you could see people thinking like computers. They think in hexadecimal based uh, uh, you know uh, no and I have a few mutual friends that I would probably define them at that bleeding edge. Um, I'm just not that type. So I had to kind of choose, uh, what I wanted to do next. I had this very naive vision of if you probably combine law, business and technology, then you could run business or product or, or many other functions for a, a technology company. Um, so Three days after I got released, I, I just started learning. Released from the army. Yeah, released from the army, yes. Like three days after. And by the way, that, that, that is a very, very, very interesting and educational experience. But pretty early when you an, analyze the industry, or when I analyze the industry, again, from the perspective of a 22, 23, 24-year-old person, you understand that, that naive thought of... Um, The legal or business work in the segment, especially from the legal aspect, it's, it's predominantly legal structuring and legal paperwork and compliance, and you're not really into the tech and you're not really into the business as much as you can anticipate, which meant that I had to literally structurally map the different segments in the world that offer a combination of tech, legal, finance, and business skills. And if I'm fully honest with you guys, then it meant either doing, you know, because c- think of an entry level now, okay? Don't, don't think of, of, of something big. Think of where you start your career from. So that either meant going into a tech company, but probably as an operation function or as a product fun- function, et cetera. Um, and, I, and I did have a few pro- open processes with multiple companies there. It means you either go into investment banking Uh, and specialize in the tech sector, right? You can do investment banking and specialize in that category. Um, and then you're probably uh, much more of a financier that understands the high level 
um, and and the mid to late stages, but not the the you know the phases of actually building from scratch. Uh, you could do VC, which is uh, closer to entrepreneur zero two, but less. You know, you f- full disclosure. I, I imagine most seed funds don't really run unit economic analysis and and and, and you know stuff like that. Um, and or, or you could do management consulting, right? These were the four options. So we, we, it, it was either like product operation, uh, investment banking, management consulting, or VC. Um, I decided to start all of them in parallel, which was a mistake. Um, I couldn't choose. And and by, by the way, by now I know that the interesting strategic decisions that you make are the ones who that you choose what not to do and what to focus your energy on. But it's very easy to say, let's do everything. It's very challenging to say what you're not doing. Renan is always saying that as well. So I, I was like 25. I didn't know anything at that time. So I started looking for everything in parallel, you know, uh, learning the McKinsey uh, frameworks of so like the, the BCG Bay and McKinsey frameworks and preparing for interviews and, uh, and, uh, and also uh, applying for investment banking and also uh, literally reaching out over LinkedIn to every VC in Israel. Um, and I had a couple of, uh, you know, product and operation positions or, or processes with, with companies. And the VC, by the way, was the most challenging to get into. Honestly, it's, it's the smallest industry and the steepest pyramid. You know, you don't need a lot of people to manage a lot of money in VC. If you look at, uh, at that industry, usually these organizations are not that big. So where well, I literally could strike an opportunity to join a, a relatively small but super interesting VC as an intern for minimum wage, I said, yeah, it's worth the time. Let's, uh, let's give it a shot, right? And that's literally how I got into VC. Like, I know that was a pretty long story, but that's the full answer of how I got into VC. And when you were a VC, so like we were talking to a lot of people about the investments that they made. So like when you looked at the dead diligence to a certain company or, or like what were like the top three things that you were looking for? Like when, when we start, everybody, every, you have the playbook, right? A big market, a big opportunity, the right team. Like the real, the real deal breaker, red flags, green flags, you know, like. First of all, I made my fair share of mistakes in VC. Uh, I'm, I'm definitely not clean from them. And, uh, if I had to kind of summarize what, what I at least think now, so I think you're looking for people who are extremely passionate about what they do. These are usually people who are either very quickly or already are, uh, industry experts. Um, in, they, they just bring a, a very interesting perspective. Okay. Uh, the fact that you've spent 20 years in an industry doesn't mean that you're an industry expert. Um, you know, there, there are many people who've worked for, for, uh, Intel for 20 years and you wouldn't say that they're a, a semiconductor industry expert, right? Like, uh, they, they, it, it, it needs to have another flavor and another color of, you know, seeing the market or just being open to experiencing problems or challenges or broken things within the industry that you're, you're at very curious I don't know, like the like probably there there is a long list, but uh, I think most investors, by the way, they look for a connection and people that they trust and believe in, which is everything they don't tell you about the structured framework of the size of the market or like uh, if if you build a good relationship with with a, a team and you believe you can work together and you trust them to deliver on something no matter what, and there are very few people like that, but there are people like that. I think that's kind of the leap of faith that at least doing early stage VC. Okay. I, I was doing pre seed and seed. That that's that's kind of what I know. I, I don't know pre IPOs or growth stage, which which are much more metrics oriented, right? And now how do you choose your team? So like when you built you went to the startup, like how did that affect your choices of uh, team members? We're a small team. I can tell you how we're choosing uh the people right now, but for example, when Oron and myself, Oron is my co-founder, kind of chose to to work together. Um, so A, Oron and I connected personally pretty, pretty quickly. I have to be very, very honest. Uh, I was uh, I was meeting a lot of people at that time. 
I think I met 50 to 60 people. With a specific idea or with a notion of I want to build something and I need the right partner and we'll take it from there? It changed, right? Like, uh, so, so you need, the, the initial phase was I need, like, uh, and, and then you, you hone in. And, and, uh, but, but basically, I, I had a pretty big data set. I felt like, you know, at least to some of the values that I relate to, uh, we were fully, fully synced, like hard work, like uh, uh, doing things right, um, like completing each other in terms of the skill sets and, and, and letting everybody work independently, but uh, uh, much better as a whole in, in this general strive for perfection and excellence, which is, by the way, pro- many times an enemy of a, of, of a startup company. Uh, you need to balance that. But uh, um, I, I think we both deeply believe in, and, and this is something that kind of changed over the last five to 10 years in the VC. And I think sometimes it's, it's, it's a mistake. We were, we're, we, we are so used to think in platforms and huge companies that we many times tend to forget that for a startup to succeed, usually you don't succeed by being the best of suite of something. You're succeeding in being the best of breed. You, you're not going to compete with the giants of the world on breadth. You're going to compete with the giants of the world on depth. Um, and, and if you're lucky that crack that you're coming in from could very quickly accelerate and expand into, uh, you know, disrupting or, or conquering an industry, but you got to start from a crack that you, you know, very, very deep in that you're going to win. Um, and that requires depth and, and, and excellence and other than, you know, from day one, we're going to do everything like that's very, very easy to sell as a dream, but very challenging to, to manage as a company. Did you have experiences as an investor where you were misled to invest in such enthusiastic entrepreneurs who are trying to do everything and and see that that doesn't really turn out a success? I wasn't misled. I was potentially making my mistake, but I never was misled. Right. And like, I'm like, I, li- I like actually like very much the metaphor about the finding the crack. I think like, like when, you're, when you're competing with giants, you actually have to find like that that little disruption that you can like feed on. And when you looked for the crack, were there a few cracks and you had to find what would be the easiest uh, inside or like, how did you decide? Let's focus this question on how did you decide your mindset to close all those doors and go just for that specific crack and believe in it? In it? I, I never really ran the full post-mortem, but I can share a few advice and a few feelings that come to mind right now. First of all, one of my like the entrepreneurs that I appreciate the most, uh, one of the most successful companies in Israel, uh, he, he told me something that I, in, in retrospect, I find very smart. The good, strong ideas are the ones you tend coming back to and they just don't, you know, they don't leave you. And, and again, I can just describe our process. We're very early stage. It's very early to, to celebrate. We have a lot of work ahead of us. Nobody knows we're right yet. We, we, we believe we are, but okay, let's not celebrate prematurely. But if I share openly, so our process was initially what Noah mentioned. We, we started broad. We didn't start from a specific. We, we started much broader than even a specific industry. So to, to me, the transition from VC to entrepreneurship was something that had to be managed in itself because you need to inform the LPs and you need to transition the, the boards and it's not like we had time to ideate, validate uh, in parallel to the graceful shut to, 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 you know, to managing that graceful shutdown process with the fund. So I had to leave, clear my mind, started working on something else, finding the right partner, ideating, validating the ideas, et cetera. So literally a full ideation validation process from scratch. And pretty quickly you ask yourself the important questions of, for example, why, you know, why us or why you? It's very easy to bullshit yourself and say, you know, why us? Um, but I think it, it's, there is a journey to walk of, of literally believing in, in, you know, in, in why us. And part of believing in the why us is 
again, you don't have to be the industry expert, but you have to be the most passionate or, or, or bring a unique, unique perspective or, or feel like you know the problem from an interesting angle or bring something new. Uh, I would probably say that generating a very high level ideation framework of what areas are interesting to look at is a relatively easy task. I think there are many blog posts that you can read in and, and, and kind of get some ideas. You can either write technological waves. You can see what companies were funded recently. You can talk to customers. You can follow the categories in market research companies, although that probably is a little late. Um, you can experience the, the, the problem firsthand. Uh, there, there are many ways uh, to, to ideate what problems are, are interesting. But the one that we felt resonates the the most with the market, which means that you you basically what you're doing or what we did is trying to hone in on a very, very well defined problem, which is very challenging because when you're running this with Americans, many times you get the fluffy answer of yeah, this is very interesting, or yeah, when you have something we'll deploy it. Sorry for my French, but bullshit. So you you really need to synthesize what is the problem, what is the problem, what is the problem, um, and then get relatively comfortable with the reactions that you get from the market. Initially for the problem, okay, I, I, I'm i less oriented uh, for the the approach because if you have the right team and the, the, the right people, they could probably solve the problem. Like you, you can, you, you can structure the discussion and ask yourself, okay, so there is the problem. What would an ideal solution look like? What would the customer care? Uh, that could be pricing. That could be deployment model. That could be whatever, right? Like, uh, but um, we decided about a specific problem when we just felt very, very comfortable about our understanding of the problem the different aspects and the different personas suffering from the problem that we've interviewed, you know, anyone, anyone from the very, very, very junior people, literally individual contributors within companies, um, all the way up to, uh, C levels and, and not only one C level, but could be, you know, CISO for security or CIO for, uh, the, the broader perspective of, of, of information security, like the information technologies are, and really feel comfortable with the bet. Because everybody's giving up quite a lot at that point in time. All of all of your core employees too. Like bear in mind, usually if you hire the right people, these would be people who could easily make four hundred thousand dollars, five hundred thousand dollars a year with with uh, Microsoft, Facebook, Google. You know, you need to sell them the dream as well, uh, and they need to believe in in the potential. Otherwise, you're you're not going to get the top talent. How much of a um traditional path did you walk in that sense because i would my hunch would be that since you know you're um you, you you're in your phone in your contacts you can pretty much pick up the phone and and pitch an idea to tier one investors so was that a shortcut and how much did you end up doing the traditional pitch deck i i'm assuming with uh with employees that's a, a whole other uh aspect but with respect to raising the funds I think I, I probably lost lost you in in the logical flow of the question because what you care about internally, okay, as an entrepreneur, um, you want to get to that conviction with the customers. I highly encourage entrepreneurs not to get their conviction from VCs. Oh, I'm not talking yeah. about that conviction. I'm assuming that you went to raise money when you had it. My question is... Okay. How much of the process of raising funds was a sort of accelerated one based on your network? And how much did you end up just being the, the entrepreneur who's now going to the investors and pitching? So it was very easy to generate all of the meetings uh, that we wanted to generate. That part was obviously very, very easy. Nonetheless, it was very challenging for us to raise capital. Um, again, we ended up doing it very quickly, but I, I don't underestimate the effort. Uh, it felt like a tremendous effort to, to date. I don't really know how to 
you know, to, to analyze and give you literally every insight that happened there. Uh, because you don't really know most investors, a, they never want to say no. What do they get out of saying no? They try and buy time. Um, B, when they say no, they don't really tell you why they say no. They give you a bullshit answer of why they said no, uh, hoping that you know they buy time or, or have the option for the next round. Um, C, investors are extremely, you know, FOMO and shiny new things driven. Um, and when you come from within the industry, uh, you're kind of, you're, you're, you're known. So I don't know, maybe that affected, uh, some of it. So getting into the discussion was very easy. Like I, I, I know most of the people in the industry. Um, I consider many of them friends, but in doing business, you don't really have friends. Um, and, and, and that's a lesson you, you learn very quickly. And, and I think it's a very valuable one. But that's really interesting. Tell us more about that, because I would assume if you consider somebody a friend, by there's reason for that, and you have experience working together, and they saw how you think, and they saw how you're managing investments, and now you're coming to them with an idea, with all that background, mm-hmm. and you're still saying you, that, that you learned that that doesn't, in, that, that in a way that's not super helpful beyond getting your foot in the door. So how, how do you explain that? No, how many of your friends do you highly value professionally? But that's a question that you're approaching from, I, I would say, the wrong end because those friendships evolved through business. So I'm assuming the, 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 the cost of entry to that friendship was appreciating, appreciating each other professionally, no? Not necessarily. V- bear in mind that in the VC business, what you're doing is resourcing for, for capital for yourself. People don't tend to be as friendly with that, but some are, but they just literally open the door for you. Um, Many times you have a professional uh, relationship that is based on purely deal flow sharing that isn't that deep. You you may be very good in sourcing, but necessarily not necessarily in due diligence or or selecting or building companies or or, or, or what have you. Uh, Also bear in mind, we we raise capital in a very challenging time. just the beginning of all of the legal changes that were, were taking place in Israel. And because we're in a relatively competitive, com- competitive industry, uh, we, we had to raise quite a lot. It's, it's, we, we couldn't hit the ground running with three, four, five million dollars. Right. So, right. Like I, I want to clarify something where right? he's making it sound uh, as if, you know, this was almost unsuccessful but are you able to say how much you've raised just so it's clear how many of those friends do value you professionally but i can i like we raised a little over seven and a half million dollars by the way it wouldn't tell you how how many right it could be from one or from a hundred but basically the whole point was that people who are friends don't necessarily you know they wouldn't necessarily invest in everything that you do so did that hurt? Were you disappointed by some people? I think that uh, it's humane to say yes, but I don't. I didn't put too much uh, weight on it. Honestly, I I understand. No, I I don't take it too personally. Obviously, some things surprise you and some things less. No, but I respect every decision that was made. You didn't interpret those decisions as not trusting you. Again, to some extent, but I can also very easily understand why. You see somebody from VC, why would he make a good CEO for, for building a product company? You, you know, some learnings could, uh, could be the right ones. For example, maybe an, uh, analyzing an industry or, or, or um, finding the opportunity or structuring the deal or, or, or whatever. And some experience is completely irrelevant. You, you never hired engineers. You never built a product. You never sold a you know, sold the product. Like I, I can easily see both sides of this. So what does qualify you and make you deserving to be the CEO that they can trust? I'm the idiot that's giving it a shot and believes in what he does. Like I, I, I can, you know, wrap this up in many different ways, but you know, I've probably spent a year investigating every little niche and every little aspect of the markets before uh, we ever started anything. 
we believe we can get to the right solution with the right people. And, you know, we have a very, 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 very strong team uh, behind us now. Uh, by the way, investors as well. Like our investors are amazing. Uh, the VCs, the angels, they're all top, top, top tier. What would you say your superpower is? Oof. Um, how do you translate Anna Nachtom? So uh, I probably shouldn't testify for my, for, for my own superpowers. I'm probably not well aware of them. But uh, the areas I probably feel a little stronger with are my ability to, to analyze things in a relatively cold, non-emotional manner. Um, and, and, you know, structure the discussion around them and, and, and being able to communicate. Um, so that's, that's one. I think that I can build a pretty strong reaching network of people who are aligned with the mission, with the mission. Um, and you know, this is, this came in very, very handy in both VC and in what we're doing now. I think that not necessarily in the most healthy way, but I'm a workaholic. And, you know, if you're part of the group that believes in walk hard and right and not walk right, but not hard, that helps. And I think three, three areas that you're comfortable with are enough. Well, what do you say about accountability? Like, like the being reliable as like, um, you know, like realistic, honest, um, as a persona, do you feel like it's a superpower you have? I'm not sure it's a superpower. Oh, it definitely is. At the end of the day, you said it was a superpower because when, you, when an entrepreneur comes and asks money from the VC, you said there's two things. One, being very passionate. Second, going to work as hard as you can not to lose the money, correct? Okay, so I'll give you, I'll give you the edge case that is for me challenging to endorse your thesis. And I'm, again, I may be wrong, but m- many times when you're doing sales and Noah and I touched on it, at the beginning of the call before before you joined. Um, I do not enjoy the overselling part of being in the entrepreneurship uh, side. And, and I think it's one that I can go into a lot or, or fail because of, right? Like, uh, but I, I do find it somewhat contradictory to account, like full transparency and accountability, right? Fair enough. So everybody chooses their position on that, uh, you know, that scale, but I, I, I can't necessarily define accountability as a superpower. I know many very successful entrepreneurs who are pure bullshit, but that work all the way to a successful exit. And you know what, probably I can learn from them as well. I, I, I can give you, you know, I, I don't want to mention names, but I can give you a very interesting story. So when we just started thinking about our fundraise, um, I called one of my friends who has been a very, very successful uh, entrepreneur in the cybersecurity business, raised from you know the greatest VCs in the industry, et cetera, was uh, very, very successful. And I told him, hey, so give me your advice. You know, what, what should I do in order to accelerate this and kind of lock this in? And he said, just spread a rumor. Just... Tell everyone that these other guys gave you a term sheet. Right? I told them, really? Out of all of the advices that you can give me now, you're literally telling me to spread a false rumor. Am, am I correct? And said, yeah, that's how it works. Gotcha. B- because if, if that guy thinks that you have an offer from the other guy, then he would, you know. Gotcha. And I'm talking about literally the top, top, top tiers of every, all of the stakeholders, you know. of, of the, Everybody mentioned on this call was... I wish you could interview them because I would love to hear what they have to say, but they're literally that good. So again, does accountability and transparency about where you, where you stand or being conservative and taking good care of the investor's money necessarily the best path to entrepreneurship. I haven't been proven that this is the only way. Just, I agree. It's my way, but I'm not sure it's the, it's the way. I'm open to improving anyways. That's, that's the point. And, and what would you say your, co- your key or core weakness is? What's your kryptonite? I'm a very, very, very disorganized person. I think like I'm a jack of all trades, but a muscle of none, which means I'm lacking on many fronts. Many times you, 
there is no person to do the work and you need to do it, but you're lacking on uh, many things. I'm probably overly stubborn. I, I, I need to work on that. I know I need to work on that. And again, you should probably ask my wife. She's, she's like <laughs> a, full, a, a full hour of, uh, you know, or, or ask or one. These two should probably know many things I'm, I'm really terrible in. But, but it's great that you feel so close uh, with your co-founder. So that, that shows a lot. I see him more hours a day, a day than I see my wife. And uh, we've uh, tied our destinies, or at least short to midterm destinies, uh, in one another. And I trust him fully and blindly. And, you know, I... By the way, just like marriage, I think I chose well. That's another... Maybe that's another superpower for VCs. You tend to feel... Again, you're not perfect, but you do need to feel comfortable with your making tough decisions, right? You're, you're literally um, betting on people. And I feel like on both, on the two very important decisions in life, uh, the two partners that I have, I feel I'm very fortunate. Wow. So A, wishing you to keep feeling that way, especially on the uh, entrepreneurial founders, co-founders front, uh, which we all know um, as life happens can become challenging um, and, and you guys are still uh, stealth. So we, we wish you to speak this way in a few years. And in general, that the destinies that you've tied yourself together towards, uh, that you achieve what you're aiming for. And thank you so much for spending the time talking to us. Thanks, Ray. Thank you, guys. Uh, it, it's been a pleasure. I hope it's been uh, interesting and insightful. And if anybody has any question, I'm, I'm trying to be as you know, available and reachable as I can. LinkedIn is probably best. Yeah, whatever. LinkedIn, mail, whatever. All right. Thank you. Bye, guys. That's all for today's episode. We hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please consider subscribing to our podcast so you never miss an episode. Also, if you have a moment, we would really appreciate it if you could rate and review our podcast on the platform you're listening to. This will help others find our show. And as always, if you know anyone who you think would enjoy our podcast, please share it with them. Thank you so much for listening. We'll be back as usual on the first of the month. Real. Live. Superpowers. Superpowers.